Last week I gave a two-part puzzle challenge. The first part was to use each of these uh, fence shapes here, well, the 15 that have connections, to make a single shape, using each piece exactly once. And the second part was to try to find such a shape that tiles the plane. So if you haven't tried it and you want to do it before I show the solutions, now's the time to pause and go try. Here's a couple shapes that use each piece exactly once, and this dollar sign looking shape can tile the plane just like this. And so here's all the solutions. So we have 11 solutions up there, 14 solutions down here. I'll zoom in on one of them. So it's just a shape, uses every fence piece exactly once, and you can extend this pattern endlessly in any direction. These 14 solutions down here uh, have no holes inside of them, so they're all just one solid connected shape. Uh, out of these 14, most can be done with just two kinds of fence, but three of them required um, iron bars in addition to nether brick and normal wood fences. We would say that these three solutions are uh, three colorable, whereas all the other ones are two colorable solutions. For these 11 solutions over here, these all have some kind of hole inside of them, so uh, these use the lone fence piece that uh, isn't connected to anything. You might notice that for all these solutions, the pieces are all facing the same way. They're all upright and, you know, for this one, like, this little nub here is always pointing off to the right. None of these use rotations or reflections, and that's because that turns out to be an absurdly difficult math problem. And in fact, while the Qualcomm server and I were researching this, um, one of them found a PhD paper where someone categorized which kinds of these shapes can tile the plane up to 14 pieces, and we're using 15, so they actually stopped just short of what we would have needed. In fact, the way we found a lot of these pieces was by reusing some of their code and equations from their paper. Someday, maybe rotations and reflections of all fence shapes will get its own video. For now, we're just going to focus on a single orientation tilings of the plane. In math, we'd say an isohedral tiling of the plane. I should say, too, we're also just going to be looking at connected solutions. So there's other ways you can do this, um, like this one here, where the tile that you're covering like a single layer of blocks with has this shape here. It's very weird, um, but it's a 3 by 3 two 3 by ones and the one by one And sure enough, you can fit it together with itself and totally cover uh, a layer of blocks. This one is actually one that requires rotations and reflections. So you can see here, the blue and orange blocks are the same orientation as this tile here, but the red and green are mirror flipped over. Now, you remember the problem is two parts. The first is to find all the linkages that use each fence shape once. And the second part of the problem is once you have those, to figure out which of them can fill up a single layer of blocks without gaps. So the way we found all these uh, different linkages actually wasn't using that fancy math paper. Um, it was actually kind of by playing Sudoku. So we tried a few different approaches to, you know, figuring out all the different ways we could assemble these fence shapes. And the one that worked the best was to create a grid. We're, you know, programming a computer to do this. And to just one by one place all the different fence pieces into random places on the grid. Um, and not totally randomly. We're doing it systematically so that we're covering every possibility. Obviously, you know, you have 15 fence shapes. You have 25 spaces on the grid. That's like a monstrous amount of possibilities you have to try. So uh, we can boil down and reduce the number of shapes we have to try using a Sudoku strategy. So, you know, when you play Sudoku, you have a 9x9 nine nine grid, or crossword, same, same principle, and every entry you make on that grid restricts what values or entries you can place around it. And that's exactly what happens here. So you see, as soon as we place, say, this fence shape on the grid, it restricts what other pieces can go where. So I'm using orange to mark uh, spaces on the grid that we have no idea what's going there. Green space means we've fixed a specific fence shape into that spot on the grid. Yellow means we know a fence shape has to go there. It can't be an empty air block, but we don't know what shape that fence is going to have yet. And then red means it has to be an air block or, you know, for a tiling, this would be another fence shape, but that's part of a different tile. Uh, this is a method we're using to just create the single linkages, the single shapes or single tiles. Piece by piece, we can build it up 
and each new piece adds more restrictions to the board and so over time uh, eventually the board gets more and more restricted there's less and less possibilities to try and you end up with a single finished shape and i think all in all we found a little over 600 uh, fence linkages that used each fence shape once so just as an example i've built up all the solutions we found that were five blocks wide or less and five blocks high or less so these are all the shapes that fit in the five by five grid see so not all of them are connected so we have some here that come in you know pairs of shapes here's the uh four piece linkage I showed over there and then a bunch of other ones most of these don't tile the plane um, these two do there's one question though that I didn't answer which is how do you know the grid you're using is large enough because you know we could just you know do a 15 by 15 grid because you know there's 15 shapes so there's no way anything's going to be more than 15 blocks wide but that's way too big for a computer to handle so you want to make the grid as small as possible, where you still know you're going to get every possible linkage of these fence shapes. So the question we got to ask is, what is the widest possible a solution could be? You know, and you could think, oh, well, you know, you got 15 connectable fence shapes, so 15 is the widest. The first thing you can notice is that out of these 15, three of them, is it just three? Just realized this should be a two. So out of these uh, 15 fence shapes, three of them don't even have any like sideways connections. So, you know, let's just focus on its its width left to right. Okay, so that brings it down to 12. That's a good start. But if you try to take these remaining 12 and just, you know, link them together and make the shape as wide as you can get it, the best you can actually do is just nine. The reason for that is you have to use three vertical connections while you go. And each one of those vertical connections means you have to have some column with two fence shapes in it. And that reduces the possible width by one. And this isn't even uh, the best still because you can see you have a bunch of loose ends hanging off here. Finally, the way you get the minimal grid size is to look at how many open up and down connections are and how many open left to right connections there are. See, every up and down linkage reduces the left right width by one and oppositely every left right linkage reduces the maximum possible vertical height by one but if you go through and you know count up how many uh, open connections here are you can figure out that there's eight vertical linkages and eight sideways linkages in each finished shape and so 15 minus 8 you get seven. And uh, sure enough, here's an example of a seven wide uh, solution. So to find, you know, the hundreds of possible solutions here, we took our Sudoku program, uh, fed in the different fence shapes and ran it on a seven by seven grid. And so that leaves the question out of those hundreds of linkages, how do you know which ones can actually fill up a layer seamlessly? Which ones tile the plane or tessellate, however you want to say it. And this is where the paper actually came in super handy. So uh, I'm going to do two examples here. And I'm going to skim over a lot of technical details, but this is the right rough idea. So I took the middle dollar sign uh, fence linkage out of this tiling, out of this single layer here, and placed around it all the different dollar signs that kind of share a boundary, share a border with it. And what I've done is I've colored the opposite dollar signs around its perimeter with the same color. So we have six shapes. So we have one, two, three, four, one and four have the same color, two and five, and three and six. And it turns out there's actually a relatively simple test to determine whether or not a shape can tile the plane without using rotations and reflections. And that's simply if you can divide up its perimeter into six or four sections. Here we have an example with six, there I have an example with four. If you can divide up its perimeter into six sections, so that the opposite sections of its perimeter look the same, then it can tile the plane. So here, you can see the blue edges, so the edges shared with the blue shapes, are the same. You know, we have down, down, two to the right, two to the right, one down, one down, two to the left, two to the left. You get the idea. Same with the reds and same with the greens. And then we fly over to this kind of like dragonfly shape over here. It's another solution. Same thing, we can divide up its perimeter into four sets of edges so that the opposite pairs of edges are the same. This turns out to be uh, like the perfect test. If a shape fails this, it can't tile the plane. If the shape passes this, uh, it can tile the plane. There's one side note I should mention. 
some shapes tile the plane in irregular patterns rather than kind of a nice repeating grid shape. And that's one of the open and unknown areas of math is we don't know actually if there's a single shape which can tile the plane but only with an irregular pattern. Uh, we found two shapes which together, you know, have that property, but um, in fact the paper we found was looking for a single shape that did that. And they were studying shapes that are built up from connecting a lot of squares together to see if they could find one. And they didn't find one, but uh, the paper was still super useful. And last thing I want to mention that's super cool is how to solve part one of this problem in higher dimensions. So in 3D, 4D, in fact, the solution uh, I'm going to share here works for any number of dimensions. The way this method works here is we're going to take a solution in a lower dimension and use copies of it to make a solution in a higher dimension. So we'll start with something familiar and build up um, the one dimensional version of this problem up to the two dimensional uh, version of this problem. So in one dimension, you know, we only have four possible fence shapes. So this is just fences which are connected along a single straight line, one dimension. Out of the three pieces that have a connection, there's actually just one solution that's, you know, just put them together like that. So that's our one dimensional solution. We're going to take this now and build up a two dimensional solution from it. One thing we could try, you know, we look at this and say, okay, okay. Well, if I take, I'm going to use glass blocks here to represent the fences. If I take a copy of this shape here, second copy there, third copy here, and a fourth copy of this shape, I'm actually almost done. Because you can see no fences in this two-dimensional shape will have the same uh, connections as each other. So each slice here has the same one-dimensional connections, but, uh, you know, the red one here has all the upwards connections as well. The green slice here has both upwards and downwards connections. The blue slice has just downwards connections, and the yellow slice has neither upwards nor downwards connections. There's two problems here. One is that, you know, obviously this isn't even connected. This is two disconnected uh, linkages. The second problem is that there's actually a few fence shapes we've forgotten to use. For the one-dimensional version, there's only three uh, connectable fence shapes, but there is an unconnected fence shape. And when you bump up to two dimensions, there's four, there's four different ways you could add uh, a second dimension of connectability to that disconnected uh, fence post over there. Which is, you know, you leave it disconnected, you connect it upwards, or just downwards, or both. And the problem is, these three pieces are connectable and we need to incorporate them into our solution somehow. If you fiddle with this for a while, what you'll figure out is that actually if you just shift over these pieces in just the right way, you can fit it all together. So we can go through here and, you know, look at maybe, say, the uh, leftmost piece for each of the one-dimensional solutions. This one isn't connected upwards or downwards. This one is connected both upwards and downwards. This one's connected just upwards, and this one is connected downwards. You could do the same thing for the middles and the right sides. And we've used each of our weird, you know, pieces here. I'm not even sure what to call them. The pieces which were uh, disconnected in one dimension but became connectable in two dimensions. And sure enough, yeah, got all of them used. So this is a way to build up a two-dimensional solution from four copies of the one-dimensional solution plus three extra pieces. And what's super cool is you can actually rinse and repeat this process. So, for example, we can take this shape, and I've, I've done my best to visualize this here, but you can take three copies of it, connect them together in just the right way, and get a three-dimensional solution. Uh, it's We don't really actually have a way to visualize three-dimensional solutions in Minecraft, because there's no block which can connect, you know, forward, backwards, left, right, up, down, independently, and create, what would that be, 64 different possible shapes. So I've also visualized it here. You know, as you could imagine if we did have a block with that property, we have 63 white glass blocks here with their uh, connections represented by chains. And every one of these 63 glass blocks has a different, like, I don't know, adjacency fingerprint, you could call it, a different uh, set of chains on its sides. So you'll never find uh, two pieces that have just 
a chain on the underside. You'll never find two pieces that just have a chain on the forward, left, and bottom side. One trick we do need to use to make this work is the three copies of the shape we're using here aren't identical anymore. Two of them have a short nub on their left side, and then oppositely on the right side, the two that have a short left side nub have a long right side nub, and the two that have a long left side nub have a short right side nub. Uh, what's going on here is that the uh, block that's connected both up and down and nowhere else, we're moving from here to here to create slightly different copies of the shape. And the reason we're doing that is because by tweaking the shape a little bit, uh, that's what lets us fit in these extra three blocks. I've done the same thing here with a different solution to the 2D problem. So building this one up into a different 3D solution to the problem. And the part that's super crazy is that you can do the same thing where you kind of extend and retract one of its nubs and build up a 4D solution. So you have to imagine here that, you know, each, every nine blocks you go up is actually moving one block in a fourth dimension. There's tons of connections that aren't being marked by chains here, but I've added in the chains to just mark the connections to the extended and retracted nubs and those uh, three extra um, shapes. So if you have your own Minecraft puzzle that you'd be interested in seeing a mathy analysis on, go ahead and leave it in a comment and it might be the subject of a future video. My name's Chris, thanks for watching.